Our God is a God of story. How many of you enjoy a great story? It's down in the human heart to love story, to love a narrative, to love something that comes and begins to move us and show us and teach us something of a, that which is around us because our lives are a story. And so we've been made by a God who is a God who is a storying God. In fact, we call um, all of the events of the past, we call that what? What do we call that? History. We call of that, part of what you see there is a story that is there. Um, Christians have enjoyed saying it's his story. It's his story upon the earth. But this morning we want to come and we want to look if we're going to get all that we can get out of this important letter, this important narrative from the book of Titus, the letter of Paul writing to a young pastor, Titus, we need to see the character of the one that is being written to. Now what's interesting when it comes to character development, um, it shows us how important it is to have um, characters in a story. It's very difficult to have very much of a story without characters. Uh, one of the thir first things I want to just kind of address here, you see the title of the message is Character Development for the Gospel. Um, we, we are looking at Titus's life. We've been looking at Paul's life. Whenever you study the Bible, you study the, the characters of the Bible in order to be able to gain from it. And most amazingly, most beautifully, God, our personal, relating, storytelling God, allows us to enter into walk with him in life in part based upon what he has done and what he has done through the lives of other people. So we learn their story. Now, when we talk about character development, in a story, um, in any type of story. Um, there's really um, a lot of different ways that you can view that. I, I think about um, those who de have developed character um, in their own personal lives, and there's two senses that come to this mind. The first one is a moral training. If you're a teacher in the Broward County School uh, District, um, we have uh, a program that has to do with seven pillars of, of development and uh, character training. So there's one idea when you're talking about character development, you're talking about the development of an individual. There's another idea of character development, and it has to do with revealing, revealing the players in a narrative or in a story. Now, some of you um, love literature. Some of you enjoy reading widely, and uh, you enjoy stories through, through novels, and you enjoy stories through history. The Bible has a, a breadth of characters that is incredibly important for us to, to dive into and to enjoy. We begin, if we study the scripture, we see that God is working through people and we, we see their lives, we see their strengths, we see their weaknesses, and God intends for us, listen, to see his redemptive work through his people. And he works in a way that, and, and he, he allows us to see and hear the story of what he has done in this beautiful picture of how he develops character for us and showing us what it is that he does. Now, one of the great characters of um, the Bible is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. He's, in fact, the writer of this. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the Apostle Paul. We've already talked about him a little bit. But part of the reason is, is that we, we know so much about him if, if we um, are at all versed in what the Bible says, if we are at all versed in the narrative of the Bible, the Apostle Paul shows up over and over and over again all through the Scripture, all through the New Testament, other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. After that, you see that the Apostle Paul had a monumental impact. Now, it would be hard, listen to this, it would be hard to overstate his impact on the first century church, 
Only the Lord Jesus Christ would have had more impact on the church, obviously, far and away, than the Apostle Paul. It's his church. He's God in the flesh commissioning the church. But God rose up a man named Saul of Tarsus who would become Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, for a, for a great and glorious purpose. If you do this character stu study of the Apostle Paul, listen to this, you're going to be amazed by his background, his education, his opposition to Christianity, and then his, his conversion, what we call the Damascus Road experience. He repents of his sin. He, he believes upon Christ. He's called to obey Christ and to preach the gospel. We see his obedience, his boldness, his temperament. We see his persistence. He, over these decades, he becomes incredibly persistent, preaching the gospel. After being beaten and run out of town, he picks himself up, dusts himself off, goes back into the town over and over and over again. I mean, he is shipwrecked. He's lied about. He's whipped and scarred and beaten, and he keeps going and keeps going, even when he is old, even when he can't see very well and dealing with all kinds of troubles in his life and his, even his physical body. He continues. And from prison, he continues. He continues writing. He continues discipling. He gives his life as a living sacrifice. And it's in his writing that we see so much of what God had done in his life. But think about this, though. The Apostle Paul was just of the New Testament. What about the huge figures of the Old Testament? Who are some of the huge figures from the Old Testament? If we go way back, we go back to Noah, right? A, a huge figure in the Old Testament and his tremendous faith in obedience and opposition and his continuance in doing what God had called him to do through which God would bring salvation to the earth through Noah. Abraham, Abraham, the father of our faith. Abraham, the glorious one who would hear from God and go out and believe God even when there was potentially massive sacrifice. And then you see the great life of Moses and all of the development around Moses from his special birth being hidden in Egypt and then eventually being run, raised as a, uh, as a son of Pharaoh only to run for his life to the backside of the desert for 30 years. He has a burning bush experience. He's called to go back to Egypt. He goes back and he, by God's great power, leads God's people out of their bondage in Egypt, across the wilderness and up to the edge of the promised land. A life lived of massive character development and faith. And then you look at King David. You see David from being a shepherd's boy all the way to being the king of Israel. We see this massive transition. We see this massive heart for God. The great and glorious prophet Isaiah, another one of great character development, of, of a message that would come from God that would foretell the coming of the Messiah. All of these um, that, that we would see point to the message of our Lord Jesus Christ and to Paul and to his great message, this one who would be called Saul of Tarsus, who would become uh, the leader of the Gentiles, the apostle to the Gentiles. But Titus, Titus is all in this mix. And I want you to see on the box on your page right there, Titus chapter 1 and verse 4. We have looked at Paul and the message. I want you to remember as I read this passage of Scripture um, very quickly, I want you to see what God has done um, in these last few weeks as we've looked at these, who Paul is and these great doctrines that are here. One, Paul, a, verse one, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ, the, to the sake of the faith of God's elect and knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. Verse two, in hope of eternal life, which God who never lies promised before the ages began, and at the proper time invest, manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Verse 4, to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Savior. We, we cannot overstate 
the importance of what this introduction means to the study of the rest of the letter. There are all kinds of hints that are here. We've said already in number one in the review, I want you to very quickly, we're going to fly through these, and there'll be a couple of new points in here, um, but I want you to see these. The first thing is Paul's letter to Titus is one of three what we call pastoral epistles, or what is that called? Those are called letters. Now, there's only three of them, and you see them on the very next line right there. It's First and Second Timothy and Titus. These are letters from Paul to young pastors, to one to Timothy, excuse me, two letters to Timothy and one to Titus. You see, they are written, fill this in, they are written to specific young pastors, Timothy and Titus. But they are also intended for their congregations. And one of the reasons we know that they're intended for their congregations is, look at the next line, we see the benedictions or the closing remarks that are addressed to all. And so we see that this isn't just a letter for Timothy, it's a letter for the people that he's leading. It's not just a letter for Titus, it's a letter for the people that he's leading. Not only is it to these two young pastors in their congrega congregations, but look at the third bullet point there. They survived, these letters survived the canonization process the canonization process, that is the, the vetting process of the early church to, di to discover what letters that are circulating are indeed the Word of God. What letters does God intend for us to have? What letters are timeless? What letters are for all people? What letters bear the marks, the special marks, of being Holy Scripture? There was a process in which that happened. It was called the canonization process. It happened primarily in North Africa, in Carthage. I've been to the ruins of the church where those councils met for over a hundred years from generation to generation. They were determining of all these letters that are circulating in the Roman world, in the Mediterranean world, which ones are the ones that are the proper word of God, the ones that the Holy Spirit would have us seal together as the New Testament. It is a fascinating process. There are books in the bookstore written on that that deal with that. I've preached on it before. It is a glorious picture about how God brought the church together through the power of his Holy Spirit, helping them see what belonged in what we call the canon of Scripture. And so because these, two, these three letters, First and Second Timothy and Titus, the one that we're studying, because they made it through the canonization process, listen, it shows us that they are for us too. These letters are for us. This letter is for you. Titus is for your life. Titus is for my life. Titus is for Sheridan Hills. And I have a smiley face on that because I like being included in God's grand plan. Amen? Um, this is for us as well. Number two, we've seen that Paul references um, his references to himself in the introduction. One, he refers to himself as what? A slave of God, a doulos. We see that he refers to himself as a messenger or an ambassador of Christ, apostolos. That is a, a, an apostle, a messenger, and a, an ambassador. Look at the third one there. Paul refers to his command from God to, and I have this word here, very, very important, carefully preach. He was called to carefully preach the gospel. It comes from pistuo, which means to entrust. Now, I want you to see that up in verse 3. Look at verse 3 with me in the box on the top of the page. And it says, And at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching, and then look at this, with which I have been what? Entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. Circle that word, entrusted. You see, this communicates the fact that what, is, what has been called upon him to preach is is a very valuable thing. The gospel is valuable. The gospel should not be forgotten. The word of God should not, be, should not be put aside. The word of God should not have a lesser place. Here what we see in this picture is that Paul says, I've been entrusted by a command of God to preach this word of life. And so we see this beautiful picture of 
how important the gospel is. Look at number three. Paul's intro is packed, and there's two that are here. Part, number three and number four are somewhat new, but I want you to see this. Paul's intro is packed with massive doctrinal significance. That's the reason we would take time. Don't skip it. Notice what is here. What have we looked at over these last five messages? We've looked at, number one, God's election of his people. I mean, it doesn't get very much larger doctrine than that. God's election of his people for the faith of God's elect. Look at the next one there. God's sovereign reign through all of truth. Through all of truth, he reigns through truth. It says that, that he, is, he is praying for God's elect that they would have the knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness. And it's not just truth, but it's the truth. You see that in the scripture. There is one truth. There is only one great truth. That is, a, that is something that's not very popular in this day and time to say, but that's exactly what we see through all of scripture um, and even through logic. Look at the next part here, the third one. God's sovereign reign through all time. You see, before the foundation of the world, before um, the ages began, he would come and he would make his promise. This is the God over time. And this is the God we've also seen here of his loving salvation. In verse 2, it speaks of the hope of eternal life, that he comes and he gives us loving salvation as a result of his word, the word made flesh and given for us. So there's these massive doctrinal significance that is here for us over these coming weeks. But look at number four. Paul's intro is packed with loaded personal statements for the Cretans. Um, these are loaded statements. You say, what in the world do you mean by that? Well, sometimes think about this in family life. You come in from work, and uh, you walk in the door, and you say, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm fine. <laughs> what does that mean? <coughs> that means he's not fine, or that means she's not fine, right? That's the first thing you get um, when you see that. You would say, oh, that's a loaded statement. You know, or I would have done what you said to do, but, and then there's something else that comes after that, and it's a loaded statement. Um, in fact, um, the more codependent you are, the more you will use those statements, quite honestly, as you are seeking to manipulate the other person, as opposed to just simply saying what it is. You, you, we, we may tend to use a lot of loaded statements. We need to watch that. I have to watch that. We all need to watch that. But, but notice here that these loaded statements are here, and they are simply a precursor of what is the rest of the letter, what is going to be dealt with in the rest of the letter. In fact, while you and I might read this and say, oh, yes, to the faith of God's elect, knowledge of the truth, and courts with godliness, that's good, and hope of eternal life, a God who never lies, promised before the ages. Oh, I, wonder, I wonder what all that means. Well, let me tell you, I believe that when the Cretans read this letter, they, they knew line by line what this meant. In fact, rather quickly, when he's talking about for the sake of the faith of God's elect, he's saying, Wow, God is the one who elects not, not everybody around us, and it's not who's popular in the church. It is God who is at work in this. Maybe we've had a lower view of salvation in the life of our church. This is talking about God's elect. And then he goes on to talk about that it's a knowledge of the truth. Not just truths that are out there flying around in, in Greek culture or out there flying around in Cretan culture. It's talking about the truth, and it accords with godliness, a godly life. So already, you can begin to see some people maybe squirming in their seats as they say, I know that some of my views are not the views that have been taught um, by the Apostle Paul when he came or the others who came and planted this church or I know that some of my behaviors are not in accordance with this, um, with the truths that are taught in the Bible. See, so the Cretans, as they read this opening letter, they would maybe be saying, hmm, I wonder who he's talking about. Notice this with me. True Christians, or God's elect, fill this in. True Christians, God's elect, act like it. We already see that in this introduction. It, it, they, they act like it. it, it 
it affects their life. Their godly life is affected by that. True Christians have a God who promises and delivers as opposed to a God who lies. And so they're, they're recognizing that, that this God is a God that can be depended upon. He never lies like Zeus. Look at the next one there. True Christians, excuse me, true pastors have been commissioned by God, not themselves. What we, be, what we begin to see is that that just because somebody comes in saying he's a teacher, just because somebody comes in and he has perhaps different doctrines, that doesn't mean that you should make him a teacher. He's saying we need to be very careful about that. We begin to see that right here in verses 1 through really 5. Now, I want you to notice the timeline that is here. Some of you, I, this will help you a little bit. Think about the conversion of Christ, Paul's timeline, his coming to Christ right around the time that Jesus was crucified. Within a matter of months, I believe, um, it is likely that Paul came to faith in Christ. The church was beginning to grow. We saw a lot of things happening. Persecution started. There's a conflict between these new Christians and Jews, many former Jews that have become Christians. Things are starting to boil over. And at one point, they even come to kill the very first martyr, whose name was Stephen, and Saul was standing there in the crowd. Saul kept, tr kept track of the cloaks, of the coats, for the people who were taken off their coat to go stone Stephen. And Stephen gives up his life praying for those who are, who are persecuting him, praying for those who are, who are martyring him. So the very first part martyr, the, uh, the Saul of Tarsus witnesses. He comes to faith, he's converted, gloriously converted, and after a period of time, uh, he's, he's discipled during that time, and then after a period of time, he goes on a first missionary journey, a second missionary journey, a third missionary journey over those decades, and those are approximate dates. Some of those would be longer. For instance, second missionary journey, he spent a year and a half in Corinth by itself. I mean, he lived during that journey for there for a long time. He got to know them very well. And, but then eventually, he is martyred in Rome. And we're not sure the exact time, we're not even sure the exact year, but somewhere between 64 and 67 AD, he is put to death. Um, tradition tells us he was beheaded for his faith in Christ. Now, so this is the timeline that is there. And, and Paul, during this time, from 33 to upwards of even 67, here are decades where Paul is at work. Now look at the other side here. This may blow you away. And, and let me tell you, it's been good for me. Until this study, I had never really contemplated Titus's role. In fact, if you had said to me, well, who were people who traveled with Paul? Who are some names, of the, 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 especially from the stories that we, we read from the New Testament, taught in Sunday school? What are the names that go with Paul? Paul and... Paul and Barnabas, Paul and who else? Silas, somebody said Paul and Silas. Who else? Paul and, how about Timothy, right? Timothy, Paul, would, Paul spent a lot of time with Timothy. We, but, you know, we often think of Paul and Silas in the jail praying, the, the earthquake comes, they are finally released. We even think about James, the half-brother of the Lord, as they were there. And even Peter, who, man, Paul and Peter had a pretty big run-in. You can read about it in the book of Acts, and it has to do with something we're going to see right here. But here we see that Titus was with Paul for decades. The guy who we're reading the letter that, and we're studying the letter that Paul saw important for, for him in order to do various things in the churches of Crete, it was very important. Look at this, Titus's appearance and his mentions. He's in Jerusalem. When there's, he's in Jerusalem with Paul numerous times. And in Galatia, that's a region. We see that in Galatians too. We're going to read about that. Look at Paul with, in Ephesus and in Antioch. He's with Paul in Corinth. In fact, in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, he's mentioned nine times. And he's with Paul in Crete. And he's left there to straighten out the churches. Strangely, though, 
Titus is never mentioned in the book of Acts. And that is perhaps why we don't hear very much and we don't in our Christian um, history very, very much focus on the character of Titus. But that would be a mistake because Titus, as you're gonna see in just a few minutes, played a pivotal role in these decades of Paul's ministry. And it means that we must listen to what he was doing in the life of the church, not only in Crete, but uh, all across um, the whole area. Look what it says there in the box on the top of the page. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I've included verse five because I want you to see as he jumps in, that's the, verse four is the end of the introduction. Verse five is the first big section, section. And I want you to notice what he immediately jumps into. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Now, over the coming weeks, we're going, to, we're going to look and see what is he talking about, appointing elders, why is that so important. But I want you to see that Titus and Paul are so close that Paul goes off and leaves this monumentally important task of appointing elders to Titus. At this point, and you can write out there to the side, this was possibly around the year 62 AD. So this is toward the end of Paul's life, this is after Titus and Paul have known each other for more than 20 years. And so they've, they've known one another, they've traveled with one another, they've done ministry with one another. We're going to see how, how important they have played together, along with several other characters that are here. But I want us to see how much he was a trusted associate of the Apostle Paul and how much we can gain from what Paul is telling him to do. Look at number one here, the character development of Titus, the spirit-filled man. Number one, Titus is Greek, and that's a big deal. This means he is a Gentile, and a Gentile means a non-Jew. Now, let me say to you, you say, well, that doesn't mean such a big deal for us in this present day and time in 2018. Oh, well, it does, because of so many things that we learned from the conflict that was in the early church. We can look and we can see that the gospel begins with Jewish believers. The gospel begins with people who were followers of the Old Testament truths of God's word. Jesus comes through them. Jesus himself was a Jew. This becomes a huge issue, though, when Greeks start to become Christians. Because now it's no longer just ethnic to be Jewish or maybe even Jewish Christian. Now you're saying we're bringing in the other peoples of the world, the non-chosen peoples of the world, the people that were not formerly God's people. We are God's people. What are you talking about? And even if you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, don't you see that Jesus came through the Jews? Well, there were many who would love to leave it at that. That this is the Messiah just for the Jews. And the Apostle Paul says, how dare you? That is not at all God's plan. All you have to do is read the Old Testament scriptures. All you have to do is listen to the words of Christ himself. He's saying, this gospel isn't just for you. This gospel is for the whole world. You see, we can apply that to our lives in this day and time because if we're not real careful, we can act like the Jews. After we come to faith in Jesus Christ and we begin to see what all he has done in our lives and we begin to see all that God has done to forgive us, to forgive us and to lift us up in him. And then if we're not very careful, we can look down our nose at a lost and dying world and go, my oh my, what a bunch of pagans. And not be concerned that they come to faith in Christ themselves. You see, this applies, folks. This applies to you and me as we see the early conflict that is there. If we're not careful, we can subtly fall prey to very similar tendencies. And it's this beautiful conflict that helps us to see the true gospel and the true gospel of a God who comes that people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation will lift up 
holy hands before him on that day. So notice this, fill it in if you haven't already. This is a huge issue. He is close to the massive, so Titus is close to the massive figure of Paul, a converted Jew, by the way, who is called the apostle to the Gentiles. So Titus, a Gentile, is very, very close, walking with Paul, traveling with Paul, ministering with Paul for a long time. He goes, Titus goes with Paul into the great controversy of Jews versus non-Jews in the early church. Fill that in. He goes into this great controversy. Now, for those of you who are new to studying the Bible, you really need to get this concept because there's, in fact, there's a couple of key words here that will make you go, what's that all about? And you can get a big concept right now if you just listen for the next three minutes, you will see this. I want you to notice this, these two sides that are here. There's the traditionalist Jewish, and I'm going to put Christians in quotes, because they claim to have come to Christ, but they're still holding on to their Judaism. In fact, they were called Judaizers. So they would come into the churches, they would say, oh yes, we believe in this Yeshua also, but you better continue to keep the law. You better continue with all of the rituals. And anyone who comes into this mix, you need to make them Jewish before they can become a Christian. Those are called the Judaizers. Fill that in or just look at it, make note of it. They keep the Old Testament law and its rituals. Now that as opposed to converted, baptized Christians. These are people who would say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I heard that Jesus died for the sins of the world. I heard that Jesus died for me, and I have identified myself with him. I've repented and believed. I've been baptized in him in the name of Christ. And they would say, this is what Christianity is. So it's Jewish, it's Gentile, question mark, question mark, doesn't matter. It's Christians, people who have been saved by faith in Christ. Look at the next word that is here, and this is the word that can throw many new students to the Bible off. The circumcision party. Yes, these are the guys running around with a sharp knife. And these are the guys that are saying, oh great, you, you, were, you were Greek or you were Roman or you were Italian, you were, you were from Gaul or you're from North Africa. Great, you've become a Christian, come here. Um, I mean, you need to be circumcised because that's the picture of the Old Testament sign of God's people. And they were, they were still upholding this picture of Old Testament law. That's the circumcision party. These are the people who are seeking to make you Jewish if you claim to have become Christian. Now, if you're new to studying this, you really need to see this because it pops up over and over and over again in the New Testament. And this will make more sense if you get this down in your mind. On the other side, you see the non-circumcision party, the people who simply didn't do that. They said, no, you need Christ, and you need to be baptized in Christ. This is the symbol of what a Christian is. And your life, the way you live, is what shows what you are. We're not trying to make you another ethnicity or some other cultural uh, or customary uh, type of person. Ultimately, the traditionalist Jewish Christians, as so to speak, on the left, they would believe in faith in works. They were still caught up in works. They were still caught up in the law. They were still caught up in what all you are going to do. But Jewish, Gentile, whatever, Christians, Bible-believing Christians is what they would eventually become, is faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus' sacrifice for their sins. You can put out there to the side, grace. They came to understand that our salvation has nothing to do with our own works and our own uh, works of righteousness, it all has to do with the works of righteousness of Jesus Christ, especially when he lived and died, was raised again on the third day for us. You see, the traditionalist Jewish Christians, they were really promoting just more religion. They were promoting more religion. Whereas Jewish, Gentile, whatever, Christians, they were promoting new covenant relationships. This is the new, Jesus held up the cup and he said, this is the new covenant of my blood that is shed for you. Do this as often as you 
as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. You are confessing your faith in the new covenant of my death and resurrection. Jesus is saying that what you need is not more religion. What you need is right relationship. Now, let me just tell you that the last thing in the world a Muslim needs to hear is a new religion. Muslims have religion coming out their ears. I mean, you've got to keep up with the pillars of Islam. You've got to keep up with what everybody expects around you and all of these other things. If you come promoting a Christianized religion, they've got all of that they can stand. What they are looking for and what is the cry within the heart of, of those who God is calling to himself is this picture of a relationship with God. Friends, the people up and down the streets here in South Florida, they don't need religion. They don't need to hear religion from us. They need to hear a true relationship of forgiveness and grace from God, a holy God who would die for our sins and redeem us to himself. This is the new covenant relationship that they need. So Titus, just imagine this. Look at that, the, that comparison there on your page. Titus comes into this great controversy. And we're going to look at Titus, um, or excuse me, number two, and then we're going to read Galatians 2, and you're going to see this. It's going to make a lot of sense. Look at number two. Fill this in. Titus becomes the model Gentile believer at an early meeting in Jerusalem. And if you have your Bible, take it and turn with me to, to Galatians chapter 2. I want you to see Galatians chapter 2. I want you to see this passage of Scripture. And... Um, Paul tells about an event. He's writing to the Galatians. Now, just keep this in mind. The Galatians, they really were struggling with what is the whole gospel, what is the true gospel. And they kept adding to the gospel. And what Paul was writing to them to say is, stop adding to Jesus. Stop adding works of, of religion. Stop confusing the gospel. And he even goes to make the point and to tell the story of when Titus was with him in Jerusalem years ago, um, showing them what had happened. So now what's also interesting is Galatians was, is one of the earliest letters written to the churches. Do, do you remember what the first letter written to the churches was? We studied it several months ago. James. James was the first letter written to the churches. Here we see that Galatians is one of the other early letters, very, very early in the process. But look with me in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 1. And we are going to read um, about 10 verses here. And this is why I encourage you, if you don't have an ESV or an NAS Bible, I encourage you to get one so it's real close to the translation I'm reading. Otherwise, you can get lost. Those are available in the bookstore. Um, I encourage you to get one if you're new to us. It makes longer passages much easier to read. But look with me in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas. Taking who? Titus. Taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influ influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. So Paul goes to Jerusalem. He's saying, hey, look, all you Jewish guys, I'm proclaiming the gospel to Gentiles. And look at this. In the middle of verse 2, he says, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. Verse 3. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Verse 4. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. He's talking about slavery of going back to the law. This is that whole going back to Judaism. You don't need to go back to the slave of religion. Do you see that? He's not talking about taking them in slaves um, like human slaves. He's talking about the spiritual slavery. Verse 5, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. He's writing to the Galatians. He's saying, look, we went to Jerusalem. We sorted this stuff out. We didn't yield to the people who were trying to make us slaves of Judaism. And so I'm reminding you, Galatians, don't give in. Look with me in verse um, verse 6, and from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. So these, these 
people that were promoting the wrong things. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the con- verse 7, on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel, we already saw that from Titus, he was entrusted with it, pisteo, he, uh, entrusted with the gospel, to the uncircumcised, that's to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. For he who worked through Peter for an apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through mine to the Gentiles. Look at verse 9. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that grace was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they, only they ask us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. So I, I just want you to see that in, in the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul is writing to these Galatians, and he's saying, you guys are dealing with this Judaism thing. What you need to know is that a long time after I became a Christian and after I was preaching the gospel, I even went to Jerusalem to make sure everything was in order. I checked in with the leaders there. I showed up with Titus. Titus, who had not been circumcised, Titus, who, had, who was a Greek, I mean, they didn't make him be circumcised. So, so we, we start to see, and he's saying, if you're going that route, you're going to corrupt the gospel. That's what I hope you're seeing in Galatians 2. He's saying, don't go adding to the gospel all of these other things. This is just religion. Friends, this matters to us today because there's so many people that are so deceived about so many different aspects of our own Christian faith that they say, oh, well, you yeah, got to do this and you got to do that. And, you gotta, and they start piling on all of these human expectations, even within the context of the church. And we need to be very, very careful. Listen, the gospel is all about what Christ has done. And if we have truly come to the gospel, we are going to obey in all things. That doesn't mean all these other things need to be added on as our hope for salvation. It simply means that we're proclaiming that this God is a God who doesn't need any help in saving us. Now, I want you to see here as well that he's the model Gentile, and he's being sent into this den of religionists, this lion den of religionists. He spends the next 25 years that we know of dealing with this because that's part of the things that he's going to have to deal with in Crete. So not only did he deal with it there, but he also goes and he deals with it in Corinth. And, And I hope you have your Bible open. Go ahead and turn with me to 2 Corinthians. We're going to read a few passages in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. A little bit over there um, to your left. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I want you to see these passages. We see that he also is dealing with several other issues that are very, very similar. And in this passage, in these passages, you remember I said to you, in 1 and 2 Corinthians, Titus is mentioned nine times. And I believe that you're going to be blessed as we look and we see what he says. In verse 3, or excuse me, number 3 there, Titus is the faithful, indispensable friend of Paul. He is absolutely indispensable. Paul needs him. And I want you to see how beautiful this is. In fact, Paul, the first letter to to the Corinthians was a scathing rebuke. Corinthians 1, or or 1 Corinthians, was a real rebuke for their bad behavior. They were a church that was very, very messed up. And the Apostle Paul not only had to go deal with them personally, but he also had to send letters to them, rebuking them that would be read in public. Now imagine who gets to bring the letter like that and probably read it. That's Titus. Titus is the one who shows up in Corinth with the first letter to the Corinthians. Well, who is Paul going to trust to do that? He's not going to just trust anyone. He trusts someone that is very, very central to the understanding of the gospel. I want you to see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse, um, and I'm going to start in verse 1. Look at verse 1. It says, 2 Corinthians, so make sure you're in 2 Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit for you to you. 
Verse two, for if I cause you pain, who is there to me, excuse me, who is there to make me glad but the one for whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. Verse four, for I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart with many tears not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Here we're seeing that this is a very painful, personal letter that he had written, and he didn't just send anyone to deliver it. He sent Titus. You know, when we read 2 Corinthians, we see all of the pain that went behind Paul's writing 1 Corinthians. He didn't just fire off a letter at them trying to straighten them out. He wept over it. He was concerned over it. He anguished over it. And you know what, folks? That should be the heart of a pastor. When a pastor has to correct a church member, when a pastor has to correct someone in the flock or correct the flock, it is not a flippant, bold, haughty, proud thing. When a pastor corrects either an individual or a whole church, that is a weighty issue. That is an issue that should, bring, that should be brought about in much prayer, in much concern. And we see that with Paul. Look at what he says in verse 4. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart with many what? With many tears. He said, I didn't want to hurt you. I wanted to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Now, this makes me think of Clell Coleman when I was a rebellious child, disobeying, being disrespectful, not listening, whatever it would be, and he would say, son, go to the bedroom. And then I would hear him stop by his dressing closet on the way to the bedroom. And what was he getting out of the dressing closet? Well, for some, it was a belt, and uh, he also had a fraternity paddle. Um, that said Pi Beta Phi or whatever it was on it, no, whatever it was. And, and he would sit down and he would look at me and he said, now son, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. That, I just knew dad was a liar at that point. I mean, I, okay, you always tell me to tell the truth. I know you're lying now because you want to do this actually. And um, I don't want you to do this. Um, but it wasn't until I became a parent that I started to realize what he meant by that. And that was part of what we see in the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was saying, I had to write these things to you. I know that I hurt your feelings. I know I made you mad. But here you are claiming to be Christians and sleeping with your mother-in-law? Here you are claiming to be Christians and you're taking the Lord's Supper with gross sin in your life? You're getting drunk at the Lord's Supper? You've got to be kidding me. You're trampling down under the feet of men the glorious grace and love of God. You need to be rebuked. It's not just live however you want to live. If you claim to be Christ's, if you have come to the knowledge of the Savior, your, your life is different. Go back and read 1 Corinthians. Well, who would deliver that letter? Titus. Wow. Look at verse 12. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 12, this is so important. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me in the Lord, look at this, even though a door was open for me in the Lord, verse 13, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So the Lord opens a door, for him to go to Troas, he gets there and he's looking around. He spent time looking for Titus. He couldn't find Titus and he was not at rest. This this gives us a picture that this monumental character of Paul who's gone and preached all over the world, who's gone and been used of God in powerful ways, so depends upon this brother. Take your Bible and turn over two chapters to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 
and we see that he is being comforted, um, that God, excuse me, comforts the downcast. And God comes and does a great work in the downcast in order to show his great love and his care, even as he deals with us and works in us. Look what it says in verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 6. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by, by the coming of Titus. And not only by his command coming, but also by the comfort with which he has comforted you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still even more. Verse 8, and even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. Verse 9, as it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into what? Wow. Look at that. The end of, middle part of verse 9. I, I, was, I was rejoicing, not because you were grieved, but because you, re, you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. Now look at verse 10. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what doing, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Now look at verse 13. Therefore we are comforted, and besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. You see, this is a church that repented. And the church that repents, the guy who delivers the message and stays there with them through this process, he is excited because they've turned back from their sin. He is joyful because the church got straightened out. Let me tell you that a pastor not only grieves and not only is concerned when he's coming to, to bring about a correction to the church or to an individual in the church, but listen, when there's repentance, a pastor is joyful. A pastor rejoices that you have heard the correction and that you have been turned back to godliness. It's not about his power. You see, this is the problem of, of carnal pastors, or this is the problem of false teachers, that it's all about them. They don't have the moral authority to correct the church. But when the pastor is before the Lord, with the other pastors before the Lord, within community. You see, Titus is not doing this by himself. Titus is doing it in community with the Apostle Paul and with others. There is a community of correction. And the community of correction brings about a godly repentance. And the godly repentance brings about joy. Let me tell you that very often we are tempted to think that when we need to repent of something that that's a sad thing. Let me say to you that that is a lie from the devil. Repentance ultimately is a glad thing. Repentance is what, what will cause your heart to be free. And repentance is what your heart needs in the joy of Christ. There's a, another passage there in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'll just reference it with this. Listen to verse 16. He says, but thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care that I have for you. He's saying, Titus cares for you, Corinthians. He really cares for you. And he had walked with them through all of their sin-sick rebellion. And he stayed with them and helped them. Now fill these in. Titus was needed spiritually. Titus was trusted explicitly. 
And if you go and you read some of the other Corinthians passages, you will read that Paul entrusted him to receive an offering, not just from, Corinth, from the church at Corinth, but from many other churches. He received a large sum of money, and that sum of money was headed to the poor in Jerusalem. Remember when he left Jerusalem, they said, hey, Paul and all you're running around in the world, please don't forget the poor. Well, they were talking about the people of of Jerusalem and its surrounding area. They were the poorest people in the empire. And so they, they were calling on him not to forget their needs. And so the apostle Paul goes out, and he not only is preaching the gospel, but he even causes a collection to go to the church that is in Jerusalem, and this would bring glory to God. Look at the third bullet point there. He was willing to do the really hard stuff. Now, that's not a big technological term, theological term. That is just plain living right there. Titus was willing to do the hard stuff. He was willing to deliver the sad mail. He was willing to stay in the midst of all of the sin and work through it. He was willing to go and confront the false teachers. He was actually left behind many times to go straighten out a mess. Now, Paul, in all of his power and all of his influence, listen to this, he really needed some special weapons in his arsenal. Um, I remember in high school, um, at one point, I wanted to be a Navy pilot, and I remember it was in the 1980s, and I started studying about all of these different airplanes and all of these different powers, and I came across the F-14 Tomcat. The F-14 Tomcat had sweeping wings, which means it could draw its wings back and go supersonic. It had an arsenal of something called Phoenix air-to-air missiles. And those Phoenix air-to-air missiles could be fired from underneath the airplane, and that missile could go out to a threatening target without the pilot keeping up with it. In fact, if the pilot had three or four others coming in on him, bogeys coming in on him, he could choose one missile for that one, one missile for this one, and one missile for this one, and those could go over 100 miles away at about 3,000 miles an hour and impact that target, not with any care to him. It was called a fire-and-forget missile. He could fire it, and after he fired it, he went on to the next thing that he was doing, his bombing run or whatever it was that he was doing. Now, it's interesting to me that I I just started, when I look at Titus, he was like one of those missiles underneath that plane. That he, the Apostle Paul sends Titus off to go do a task, and he had such confidence in Titus that he could just watch from afar, let that thing go, and he could circle back on it later. He could pretty much forget it. He he knew that because Titus was going to go take care of the job, after he had been assigned assigned the duty, he had 20 years of working with him to do what needs to be done. So as we see and as we unpack the truths of Titus, we can see that Paul had great confidence that Titus was going to be able to get the job done in Crete. I believe that this will help us as we really look at what all um, the the book of Titus uh, holds for us. Look at number four. Titus is the partner and the fellow worker for the sake of the gospel. Not just for Paul, but he's the partner for us and the fellow worker for us. We benefit from what he was experiencing and what he was going to go through because the world really hasn't changed that much since this has been written. You say, oh, certainly it has. Technology is so different. They didn't have fire and forget missiles hanging on the bottom of F-14 Tomcats. Oh, no, but there is a sin continuance that is very, very similar even to this day. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 23, and I've, inc- I've included it at the bottom. I want you to get ready to underline this. Look at verse 23. As for Titus, he is my partner. Circle those words, my partner and my fellow worker, underline that, for your benefit, writing to the Corinthians. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the the churches, the glory of Christ. So give proof before the churches of your love 
and of our boasting about you to these men. He's saying, bless these men, Titus and the others that are preaching the gospel, because they are my co-workers. They are my fellow workers. They are the ones that I am so blessed by in their confidence. In all of this, we see just this beautiful picture of God bringing about his plan and his will in each of these things. I want to end with this question. Well, just consider for yourself, number one, how much did you know about Titus before now? Probably not very much. If you were like me, you had never really considered how much Titus had been with Paul all through those years. Maybe you thought about Timothy. Maybe you thought about Silas. Maybe you thought about Barnabas and all of the others. Titus was a key person in a key role in a setting not so unlike our own, dealing with not so unlike problems as our own. But as we think about character development and how God was developing Titus over all this time, think about that with me. God was bringing Titus along for such a time as this, for such a time as Crete, so that he could go and not just take care of one church, but he could go and take care of every church that is mentioned. So here's the question. Who are your heroes? In the character developments of the stories that you love, who are your heroes? And the second question is, what is the content of their character development? Titus's was all about the kingdom of God. He wanted God's kingdom to be built. Titus gave his life that others would see and hear the truth. Will we do the same? Let's pray together.